All right, let's talk about chapter 30, atomic physics. We're going to handle uh, the topics of the atom, uh, the electrons and nuclei, Bohr's theory of the atom, which was incomplete, but a good start, x-rays, and um, uh, basically emission spectra and uh, excitations of the atom. So the atom was discovered um, by... Uh, cutting a piece of leather into tiny pieces until they got to the... I'm just kidding. So the atom was discovered by um, Lavoisier doing experiments where during chemical reactions, the mass was conserved. Um, in other words, you could transform one thing into another thing, but the, since the mass didn't change, um, the conclusion was there must be some reconfiguration of the underlying structure, not a complete change. We weren't taking air from the environment and adding it into something and turning it into something. Um, the mass was being conserved in these chemical reactions. And uh, um, so there must be some sort of thing. Uh, Brownian motion is another thing where, another concept where you could watch things bounce around. Um, and so that was a, a, a way that molecules were determined to have some fundamental size. So um, we started to figure out um, that there was something that was uh, smaller than uh, the molecule, and the atom itself was um, this concept that, okay, there must be something that makes up things, and by the time the periodic table was uh, filled out and, and figured out, um, we had the idea of the atom and the electron and the proton uh, devising um, or uh, being the uh, source of all this uh, uh, variation in the elements. Okay, so the different parts of the atom that were discovered, you've got the electrons orbiting in a cloud, and then the nucleus, which is protons and neutrons. The electron was discovered using cathode ray tubes, and cathode ray tubes were just, they'd uh, ionize some electrons, a uh, gas, and these electrons, they'd accelerate and shoot them off, and then you ended up with this beam of really beautiful uh, light and these electrons could be deflected by a magnet, so that meant that they had some charge, plus charge, minus charge. Um, so the first thing they did was measure the charge to mass ratio of the electron, because they couldn't measure one or the other specifically, but they could measure the difference or the ratio of them um, based on just uh, balancing QVB equals MV squared over R and solving for Q over M. Um, and by doing that, um, that's what this derivation here is, you can get the charge to mass ratio for the electron and the charge to mass ratio for the proton. And that tells you something fundamental about these things, um, which is uh, kind of an amazing result, just to know that information about the electron and the positron. Um, the uh, Millikan oil drop experiment, he tried to um, suspend a uh, electron in a electric field and get it to sit still. And by doing that, you could measure the mass of the uh, electron by keeping it suspended um, in this field and measuring what the uh, electric field strength was necessary to hold it there was. And then by doing that, he got an idea of the charge on an electron, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Um, and then we have the electron's mass and proton's mass there from doing similar experiments. But the nucleus of the atom from Rutherford uh, shot alpha particles at a gold, gold foil. And you'd expect, because the gold foil was positively charged, you'd expect um, that the uh, atoms would kind of get deflected by the magnetic field of the proton and get this sort of spray of particle, particles. What they didn't expect was that the alpha particles would hit the gold foil and bounce completely back. And that meant that most of the time, the electrons were passing in between things, but every now and then, it would hit right dead center on this nucleus and bounce back. Rutherford said it was like shooting a gun at tissue paper and having it bounce back at you, which was uh, a very surprising result. So that was the discovery of um, the uh, nucleus of the atom. So then we had the idea of um, the electrons orbiting um, in this cloud around a very dense, very small nucleus uh, and then Bohr came along and said, all right, I'm going to try to explain the emission spectra. So if you have a, what we call a discharge tube, which sounds disgusting, but it isn't. It's just a, um, uh, for example, it's not a tube for collecting discharge, but it's a tube that um, 
discharges charge and uh, in the form of light. And so you take a hydrogen lamp and you um, turn voltage onto it and it glows. And you put it through a slit to collimate the light into a narrow beam. This is not small enough to be a diffraction slit. Uh, but this grating is, and the diffraction grating then will uh, turn the light into a prism, and then you'll get these emission lines here um, at specific colors. No, not all the colors are being emitted, so this is not a continuous spectrum. This is a emission spectra. And if you try to predict the colors that you see here, um, this is the formula you can use to predict uh, or calculate the colors of hydrogen, for example, which uh, this is not the emission of hydrogen. I don't know what this is, um, but this is a very complicated atom that's emitting that colors. Here's uh, uh, hydrogen. So in the visible spectrum called the Balmer series, you have the red, the blue, uh, sorry, the red, the green, uh, well, that's mostly blue, I think, uh, red and blue and uh, violet colors. I think there's a green one in there, seafoam green or something. And you can calculate the uh, wavelengths of the light that come out of the um, uh, hydrogen atom. And the way it works is um, the uh, wavelength of light that you predict is right there, lambda. R is some constant. And for n, you could, uh, let's say you're transitioning to the n equals 2 state. You can come from 3, you can come from 4, 5, 6. So you'd put... Um, whatever you're starting at goes into N initial. So let's say you're starting at the third energy level and you're, final, you're landing at the two energy level. It's gonna be one over two squared. So one fourth minus one over three squared or one ninth. You just subtract those two, multiply by R, take one over that to solve for the wavelength, and then you can calculate the uh, wavelength. The idea is that your final is always less than your initial. So whatever you decide to end at, if f equals 2, your initial can be any number greater than that, so 3, 4, 5, or 6. Uh, but if you're trying to land and ask what colors of light come from electrons that start at whatever and end on, say, 4, then you can only transition to the fourth energy level from 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on. Okay, and, um, and that's yeah how that works. So here's an example here. Um, calculate something uh, where your final state's 2 and you're starting at 4. Um, so you plug all those numbers in, you get lambda will be 1 over that, and so you get 486 nanometers for the light coming from electrons transitioning to that level. So that allows you to uh, calculate the um, energy level of the, uh, of the uh, hydrogen atom. Okay, uh, so the Bohr's idea was this planetary kind of idea where you've got the nucleus and the electrons are orbiting like planets around the nucleus, and you start at some energy level and transition to another energy level. And during that transition, the difference in energy is HF. And then you, that frequency, it's, it's either equals to HF or equals HC over lambda. So you can solve for frequency or wavelength, depending on what you want to do here. The other way we draw these energy levels is to say, um, here's our energy level. And it's either 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And the energy here. Uh, starts at minus 13.6 electron volts and works its way up to um, zero. And um, and each energy level gets closer and closer to zero here. And you can solve for the energy of the electron. Um, so let's say the electron is in the n equals 4 state and it transitions to the n equals 2 state. Well, you can use this formula here to go from the fourth to the second energy state and solve for what the wavelength of light would be. So. For this, n equals 4 to n equals 2, when the electron loses this energy, goes from the highest, from the higher energy state, which we label as n equals 4, down to n equals 2, it emits a photon with a wavelength of 406 nanometers, according to that uh, formula above. Okay, so um, uh, then in order to explain this, he said, well, anything orbiting anything has angular momentum, so the angular momentum of a uh, electron orbiting a uh, uh, an atom would be mv over mvr and uh, you replace all this stuff you can n h over 2 pi um, and trying to quantize these values and things like that so you end up with the Bohr radius um, which is uh, this value 0.5 times 10 to the minus 10 meters um, this is not super important for you to know um, but this was just tr him trying to match the uh, Coulomb force with the, sim uh, so there's the Coulomb force, Q1, Q2 over R squared is equal to mv squared over R, 
trying to set those two equal to each other, those forces, and uh, figure out what radius the electron would have to orbit at if those were the forces involved. And that's what gives you that, um, that uh, value. So then you can calculate the energy levels of the electron, or well, for the hydrogen atom, the electrons in the hydrogen atom. And the ground state is 13.6 electron volts. And then the next state would be 13.6 over 2 squared. And the next one would be 13.6 over 3 squared and over 4 squared and 5 squared. And so that's how you calculate the energy levels, um, which up here, they're not labeled. It's just N1, N2, 3, 4, and 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But down here, now we can actually calculate them. Minus 13.6, minus 13.6 over 2 squared, minus 13.6 over 3 squared, over 4 squared, over 5 squared, and so on. Um, up until you get to zero. If you put enough, if you put 13.6 electron volts into an electron in the uh, atom, you will knock an electron right out of the atom, um, and uh, uh, that will kick it out of there, and that's how you get ionization. So um, you can now calculate um, the uh, Rydberg constant from the fundamental units there if you want, and there's that formula, um, which is why this formula works um, even though it's incomplete. Okay, so X-rays, atomic origins, applications. So X-rays, um, there's that peak again. So here are Bremsstrahlung, and then boop, boop, our two spike th spikes there. Um, and so depending on, so we there's these jumps down choo -choo, that give you um, these characteristic uh, transitions, and those ch characteristic transitions are talked about here, and you can read about them, um, and... Uh, uh, has to do with the uh, atom that you're uh, launching your x-rays from. Uh, okay, um, blah, blah, blah. Yep, and you can calculate the energies of your x-rays that way. And there's just some background of x-ray tubes there, which is good to know. Um, I can't really test you over that stuff, uh, but it's good to know this when you get around x-ray machines. It's good to understand how they work a little bit. Um, uh, so fluorescence, phosphorescence, these types of things, um, these are all forms of some or another of uh, atomic excitations. So if you energize an atom and the atom transitions from a higher energy to a lower energy state, then um, you get uh, an emission of a photon. Um, some of these atoms, when they absorb the energy, it takes them longer to uh, um, go back down in energy level. And so that's how glow-in-the-dark materials work. You charge them up by putting them under light, and then when you remove the light from them and put them into a dark space, it takes them a long time before they actually um, go back down to the energy levels, um, the original energy levels. Uh, so the uh, uh, difference between fluorescence and phosphorescence generally is just how long it takes for the atoms to de-excite or whatever. Um, but Sometimes you, you'd, you'd, for example, there's some materials that you'll put visible light on and charge it up and then you put it in the dark and it's glowing. Other things you have to, like for example, a black light at a rave or something like that, you put the black light on and everybody's glowing. As soon as you turn the black light off, pretty much everything stops glowing. Um, so uh, depending on the time it takes for your atom to de-excite um, will give you the different sort of properties of this. And we use fluorescence a lot in biology to, to uh, target different things so that you can see them on images, uh, give them some contrast um, to be able to see. Okay, and that's how that works. Lasers, the fundamental thing about a laser is what's called a population inversion. So we have our energy levels, and most of the electrons in general live down here at the lower energy levels. And what you do in a laser is try to pump up artificially so that you have more electrons in a higher energy level than the lower energy levels. So way more electrons in the higher energy state than the down than the lower energy state. So this is called a population inversion because you've made an inverted energy level um, more populated than the lower uh, energy level. Okay, so that's the main concept between behind a laser is that um, you first pump your electrons up to a higher energy, a higher energy level, and then you um, uh, all the electrons are in that higher higher energy level, and then you can stimulate the emission um, so that you end up with one photon being emitted and that one photon causes another to be emitted and then that one causes another one and so on and then you end up with this um, coherent uh, staging and Einstein in 17 predicted uh, stimulated emission 
Um, and his paper was basically the precursor for lasers, but it wasn't until 1960-something, uh, yeah, 1964 is when they won the Nobel Prize, but it wasn't until then that they were able to actually build uh, a laser. Um, and yeah, and here's uh, how it works is you're, you're bouncing light and back and forth between these uh, lasers to try to create this situation of population inversion. Um, okay, that's a... Fusing a retina back onto the eye, if you've ever had a detached retina or a retinal tear, you can use this green argon laser to burn the uh, retina and glue it back onto the back of the retina, which is pretty cool. Um, this is the uh, NIF, the National Ignition Facility. That's a dude on a crane, and uh, all these um, holes are outlets of the laser trying to focus uh, light at a single point to ignite a fusion target there, a deuterium target usually, or a tritium target. Lasers are used to read CDs, uh, or Blu-ray discs, all that stuff, um, to make holograms, and some other cool stuff. Um, so, that's the end of that. Bye.